All right, we get a two four for CTO daily doses. We're still at Convault Gold, and Justin is still with me. We've still. been refreshed, and we just randomly plucked someone off of the show floor. Nigel, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, my name's uh, Nigel Toza. I'm the Solutions Marketing Director for uh, Convault and EMEA. All right, so big fines, big fines, big fines. GDPR is right around the corner. And Justin, you're, you, you, you look like an expert in all things. So I'm just <laughs> gonna throw this out to you. Do you. Can you explain to the CTO advisor audience what GDPR is in a nutshell? Uh, no. As if you can calculate <laughs> in, it, a in a nutshell. Uh, so, it is the General Data Protection Regulation, which has been passed by the EU, which basically means that if you are a resident of the EU, then your data needs to be protected. And it doesn't matter where in the world it's stored, if you're a company that is processing data that is, originates from or relates to in some way a citizen of the EU, this regulation applies to you. So Nigel, this regulation actually has some pretty significant te teeth. This isn't like the stuff that organizations have gotten deemed for in the past where you know, it was just a $250 million fine. <laughs> Up to 4% of global revenue per incident. I don't know, is, have you guys heard, is there a max? Is there, a max? No, um, there is no max. There's no max. Uh, yeah. And if you have a subsidiary that breaches the regulation, it actually applies to the global parent. Yep. So that's where it gets really serious. So first off, most people are hoping that this just goes away and it doesn't become, you know, not necessarily goes away, but the, it's, implement, it's scheduled to be implemented in May of 2018. And people yep. are hoping that the European Union kicks the regular, regular enforcement down the, 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 the road a little bit. But I don't, I, don't, I don't get the impression that's what's gonna happen. No, it's not. Uh, we're mm. technically already in the grace period. It's technically already a law. It just gets enacted in May next year. And, um, you know, I think the regulators, they're gonna look for if you're trying uh, to be compliant. If you are and you, you've done all the right things, then I think, you know, those things are gonna mitigate those sort of fines. But uh, I think organizations that just flout the, the rules, say they don't care, then they're the ones that I think are gonna get hit. Mm. So how is this different than how, you know, we're. I'm the only one here with a U.S. accent, I think. <laughs> uh, and we're very U.S.-centric at, at times. So we think of, you know, things like HIPAA, PI, uh, security first. How is this different from those considerations? The first thing I would say is if you're a, a multinational U.S. company, uh, it's GDPR that's getting all the headlines, but there's actually a lot of privacy regulations all over the world, you know, Australia, uh, Japan, Singapore, China, uh, South Africa enacted a similar kind of regulation earlier this year. You know, privacy is on the table in a lot of countries. Mm -hmm. So by going to the, the higher standard, you're going to help to cover yourself when you're traded all over the world. If you're a US company, you're not going externally, then you know, I guess uh, you know, it's good to be and, and right that you should uh, just comply to US laws. Mm. Yeah, I think globally, I'm not sure that American companies realize, particularly in Silicon Valley, just how much the rest of the world is sick of their privacy and data protection not being taken seriously. Mm. You know, that's always the, it's always the tagline. That whenever there's a security breach, it's like, well, we take security seriously. <laughs> um, and the way certain, particularly very large American companies have basically not paid any attention to data privacy for individuals. Um, it's not as big of a cultural thing in America, but it's far broader in, in the EU and, and where I come from in Australia. So I think that they're going to have to start taking that more seriously than they do or start being sensitive to those sort of cultural differences rather than trying to just bluster their way through that they've done because people generally worldwide are pretty sick of it and it's, it's now front of mind all the time. Yeah. You can't open any kind of a tech publication or go to a, a media site these days without mm. data being called the new oil. Uh, and it's, it's misuse of data. And all these things have happened since the last lot of data regulations were put in place. Um, so that the world has changed around it. And even GDPR says that you now have to be a state of the art. And that worries some people, like, mm. how do you define that? But what they're, they're trying to do is make the regulation so that as business and the way we process and change uh, technologies, 
it's still got to apply to that too because they don't want to go and make some new regulations down the line. So. Mm. It does seem to be a little bit more of the European tradition of law as well, which is different from the US. The US seems to be much, is much more rule-based, where you need to comply with this specific rule, and if you, if, it's, if you do something which is slightly different, that's okay, because right. the rule doesn't specifically say you can't do that. Whereas certainly the European tradition, and, and in, in Australia we follow pretty much that, which is more around the, the method and, and the intent of law, rather yeah. than the specific rules. So there are, it is open to interpretation, and the intent there is that through the judicial system, as um, as cases are litigated, some of the specifics are, are worked out through litigation. So I think you're right, Nigel, that the companies that attempt to do things well and at least make it best, you know, when we say what is state of the art, that'll be defined when people breach it. It will, yeah. And those who've made a genuine attempt, I think will be treated far more leniently than any company that just says, you know what, we're just going to bluster our way through and pretend that the legislation doesn't exist and hope for the best at the other side. We'll uh, litigate it on the, we'll litigate it. U US position is, you know what, that law is vague. We'll litigate it when it comes and we'll, we'll fight it to the letter. And if it doesn't, uh, if we can win, based on some loophole in, in the letter of the yeah. law, it's up to Congress to fix it. Yeah. And that generally doesn't happen. Yeah, that, that approach won't work with this, no, this I, kind of legislation. I, I, I just said, it's, it's going to be, if you don't comply with the spirit of it, then that, that's going to get thrown out of the court. So, so let's shift towards the technology discussion. Even though this is not necessarily a technology first problem, data is the new oil, it's the new gold. You, I, I've been to NetApp uh, Insight and now to Commvault Gold. This has been a consistent theme that data is a new asset and companies are starting to learn how to use this data to their advantage. So data is precious. If I have data on a European mm -hmm. citizen, citizen and I'm a US focused company, that's, that's a valuable thing and I don't want to have to give it up if I don't have to, but I, I'm forced to do so in cer certain cases. How do I start to car, 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 uh, compartmentalize, is the word I'm looking for, mm. data for potentially U.S. citizens, non-U.S. citizens, keep those valuable assets? Because the, the, I don't think the U.S. law so, is going to change anytime soon. What I would say, if you're a U.S. business and, and a global one, there's a lot of mistrust in politics, in business organizations these days. Consumers don't trust that their data is safe. being treated properly, yeah, or, yeah. or even safe, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and it's not just about being safe, it's about being misused. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Are you going to use it for a purpose I never agreed to? Now, if you can take the, the GDPR regulation in spirit and apply it in the US, when you think about the extra trust you're going to get from your customers, mm. you, you get, um, you're going to potentially retain more customers and you're also going to potentially attract new ones because they, they trust you as an organization. So yeah. there is quite a big benefit about complying with GDPR regulations. Hmm. Now on, the tech on, on that, it's around the data being an asset. It's not just an asset, it's also a liability. Yeah, it because is. if you keep data on citizen, like if you keep data that you don't necessarily need for any given reason, it's like, oh, we just might want to use it at some point for machine learning or AI magic you're actually placing that data at risk because if you get hacked, if there's some sort of breach from either internal or external ways, then you will lose trust with your customers and, and this is just one of the regulations that you'll be in flat of. So not purely looking at data as an asset and not also looking at it as a potential liability yeah. means that you're going to make the wrong decisions. I think more companies need to start so, looking at this uh, as a liability. Going back to what you said about you know technology, yeah. it, this is one of those people, process and technology problems. Mm -hmm. and it, you might not expect this from a tech vendor, but I'd say look at your processes and get your people educated first, and your technology needs will come out of that. Um, you know, it, it affects everything. It affects your own employees. If you, it's not just about external to your company. If you have European employees, it applies to them. Uh, you know, it, and it doesn't mean say you can't process this data. It just means you have to gain consent from the individuals mm. whose data you intend to process. And actually, that's another area that's a big culture difference from the U.S. to Europe. Most of Europe now has moved to an opt-in consent model, mm -hmm. whereas here in the US it's typically an opt-out model. Mm -hmm. You have to tick a box to say, oh, I don't want this stuff, or you will get it by default. Mm -hmm. So a couple of different models that I'm looking at is, one, we're talking about this, and there's the impression that this is a big company problem, that if you, if you, if you have, you know, you're, you have to be a Google, Facebook, etc. I'm a small business. 
I maintain a mailing list. Hmm. I'm pretty sure there's some EU citizens on that mailing list. How does that impact, you know, my small business? You're still uh, obliged to comply with that. Hmm. The thing is, you know, are we going to get, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of regulators to go around every corporate entity, however small? No, that's not going to happen, right? What is going to happen is if you're complained about to the regulator, then you might get an audit, okay? Mm. That, that's not going to get you a big fine. They'll just probably advise you what to do. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a big business and you get a lot of complaints, again, you'll get that audit. Um, it might get some bad press because they'll put that stuff in the news if they have to. Um, it's really then when you get to the breaches and those kind of things. So I've heard some people say, you know, I don't have to be uh, faster than the, uh, the the lion that's chasing me, <laughs> just faster than the next guy. But, you know, if it, a breach is a random event, that that's like tripping up, right? And that lion's going to be ready there to pounce. So um, I, I think it's going to be people who uh, make mistakes or are unfortunate that they're going to get hit. Yeah, I wonder what it, how does this impact the organization like uh, one of the credit bureaus, like Equifax here in the U.S.? Mm. And they have my information and I was an EU citizen. I just, you know, sent them an email and said, you know what, I don't want you to have my information. You know, they, I don't, I'm not a direct customer of, the, of, of them. Yeah. And, you know, they have this relationship with the, with the banks or whatever. And I just say, you know what, I just don't want you to have my information. How would that impact that business model and the credit and blah, blah, blah down the road? I think there's a lot of unanswered questions. There is. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, and it's your, uh, privacy statement from the bank and their terms of uh, use. Mm. So there are some things that you just might not be able to access unless you agree. Mm. Uh, and you know, if that's actually problematic for me as an individual, there's some things that I wouldn't want to do that, that with. Um, right. And I just think that's all up for grabs now. That there's going to be some big discussions, big court cases and things that are going, going to go on around because that. Because you can, uh, basically you can opt in to give enough I don't think it's a good word, giving up your privacy rights with a partnership. Yeah. Just say, you know what, I, it's okay for you to have my data, it's okay for you to use my data in that way I consent. And then if you decide that that's no longer the case, you know, you have to look at the, the, the language of the agreement that you signed. Mm. I think there's an opportunity here as well for an organization, or for multiple organizations, to review the way in which they use individuals' data because, again, it's a point of differentiation right now. If yeah. you say, well, actually, we will. Use, use your data only with your consent and only with very specific strict controls around it. And if you can credibly claim that and, and demonstrate that you have a really good culture of privacy and control over your own data, then I think that a lot of customers will, will actually go, yeah, you know what? I'm sick of dealing with all of these other people who, who don't respect my own privacy and don't look after my data. I choose to go with you. And that harks back to the point I made earlier about retaining customers and, and getting new ones. Yep. And actually, later on today here at uh, Go, uh, we're presenting on the business benefits of becoming GDPR compliant. Mm. So we're talking about the, the soft benefits around customers, but also, you, you know, if you treat your staff fairly, you might get better staff retention. Mm. Um, there's a, a, almost a, a debit and credit balance of, this is bad, this is gonna cost me, but there's a ton of other things that are gonna be cost benefits. Mm. If you collect only the data that you need, and only retain it for as long as you need, that's gonna affect things like uh, you know, storage purchases, cloud utility billing, it's gonna affect the DR and other things that are a cost to your organization. You know, if you start to look at managing dev and test processes instead of just letting the DBAs make database <laughs> copies whenever they feel like it and sticking them anywhere they like, and you put that into more of a, uh, an orchestrated tool that's got access and audit controls on it, uh, non, and, and again, our technology enables you to do all those things faster. That, that thing that you've done to stop you getting breached with a database in the wrong place also helps you be more agile and get mm. you know, dev and test jobs done much quicker, which adds to the bottom line. And, and actually, it's part of digital transformation, is putting customers at the center. Yep. If, you, if you can't tell me things that are gonna change just because of GDPR that are automatically going to do that for you as a business. You know, it is a, it is a stepping stone to, to transformation, in my opinion. Hmm. All right, so let's wrap up. Nigel, where can people find out more about what Convault is doing with GDPR? So uh, if you go to convault.com forward slash GDPR, uh, there's a page there. You, you get to see another great video of me talking, <laughs> if, you, if you really want to see that. 
Uh, but more seriously, we have um, some white papers, not just from Conval. Uh, we've got uh, white papers from uh, uh, analysts, uh, external, so Gartner, IDC, those kind of uh, organizations. Uh, and it's got practical advice. And I think one of the biggest uh, deficits we see, there's so much talk of fines and other things and the threats and the, uh, all, all the problems of GDPR. One thing that's missing is that practical advice. So. All right, and do you do social media at all? Yeah, me, uh, Nigel, at Nigel Tozer. Um, I'm tweeting all the time. In fact, we, we also had uh, Sheila Fitzpatrick from uh, NetApp present yesterday. She's yeah. one of the big influencers on the topic. I um, interviewed her on the queue. There you she's, go. She's very passionate she's about this She's fantastic. Topic. So, yeah. so I, and I don't just tweet about Conval, by the way. I had today and yesterday, because okay. right, it's our conference. But uh, I, I try and do a lot on privacy and, and industry articles and things uh, that can help you learn about it. Great. And Justin? Uh, you can find the company at pivot9.com, or you can uh, find me on Twitter most of the time. as at JP Warren. All right, and of course, you can find me on the web, the CTO Advisor. Dot com, the CTO advisor dot com, and on Twitter at CTO advisor. Subscribe to the podcast where we have great content like this. I'll probably pro publish this as a podcast. We went a little long for a CTO daily dose, but I think it was a great conversation and adds value. N Nigel, appreciate it. Justin, Thank you. See you soon. Thank Talk you to you next CTO advisor.